wife always says, and she cries easy, and I always remind her that tears are gifts from God. Amen. We should never be embarrassed of tears. And ladies, thank you for the violin music. That was excellent. Oh does so much music does so much for worship. Well, there we go. Hope you have a seatbelt. <laughs> Daniel 11 has 45 verses. And we have 30 minutes. So we're going to hit the high points. But Daniel 11 is divided into five major portions. We're going to start with verses 1 and 2. The first division of Daniel is the history of Persia. It says, In the first year of Darius, the Mede, I arose to be an encouragement and protection for him. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. And the fourth king shall be far richer than them all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So for several years, Persia and Greece were fighting. But this fourth king that Daniel brings to our attention is as Harris, we know him from the book of Esther. He was Esther's husband. And then he's, when he passes on, Artaxerxes, remember Artaxerxes was the Persian king who signed the third decree for Israel to return back to Jerusalem. And then there were a handful of kings after him, and the Medo, or the Persian Empire, began to crumble and become weaker and weaker. Until we come to the second section of Daniel 11, which is Daniel 11, 3 through 13, which we get the history of Greece. And it says, then a mighty king shall arise. <clears throat> now, Daniel was introducing us to Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander was not a Greek. He was a Macedonian. His father was Philip, a Macedonian. And when his father passed away, which is a nice way of saying it, because many historians believe that Alexander played a role in his father's death. And he became the new king, and he organized, or, or he brought all these different Greek countries together. He studied under Aristotle. He was a pupil of pupil and pupil of Plato. He learned, he learned wisdom and language, and he learned the culture of the Greeks. And in eight years, he conquered the known world, which was Asia Minor, Asia Minor, Babylon, Egypt, and India. And if we go from history at age 33, the banquet table in Babylon, because he was rebuilding Babylon, two days of non-stop drinking of alcohol, and a malaria fever, he passed away. Verse 4. And when he was, when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. He had eight major generals, and they began warring among themselves until there were only four. And then Greece was divided among four nations. After about 20 years of fighting. Now verse 6. After some years had passed, they will form an alliance. Then the daughter of the king of the south will come to the king of the north and make an agreement. But she will not retain her power, nor will he continue with his strength. She, together with the one who brought her child and her benefactor, will all be delivered over that time. Did you get that? All make sense? No. Clear as mud? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, history is a, is a wonderful helper. Because in 250 BC, King Ptolemy of Egypt and King Antiochus of Syria, Syria being the northern king and Ptolemy being the southern king, they wanted to have a peace agreement. And how do you get peace agreements? You, get, you marry off one of your kids. And so Ptolemy asked Antiochus to, to marry his daughter, Bernice. The problem was that Antiochus was married. So he had to divorce his wife, marry Bernice. The problem was he 
he didn't like Bernice. She got, she got pregnant. And when her father passed away, what's the first thing you think he did? <clears throat> he divorced Bernice. Married his first wife again. What do you think his first wife did? Well, she didn't trust her husband. So she plotted, this is what it's saying in verse 6, she plotted to have her husband executed, Bernice executed, Bernice's child executed, and all of Bernice's attendants executed. They were pretty nasty back then, weren't they? That is not a very pretty story, but that's the story Daniel gives us. Think of the rejection, the insecurity, and the hostility these ladies felt. But remember, the angel is telling Daniel this. It's 300 years in advance. And what we learn from that is that God knows every broken heart. He knows every broken home. And he understands the crushing pain of hostility. In Daniel's chapter 10, 11, and 12, Jesus is the focus. And Jesus comforts us, and he encourages us, and he guides us through whatever personal tragedies we may go through. But chapter 11 is not a personal tragedy. It's a global tragedy. And the angel is sort of like Walter Conkright. You guys remember Walter Conkright? Yeah. Remember his favorite closing line? Yes. So that's the way it is. Well, the angel's closing line would be, so that's the way it's going to be. God knows all about us. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Daniel's teaching us that no matter how bad life gets, keep seeking God. Amen. Because he's the answer. Yes. Now we transfer to the third section of Daniel, chapter 11. This is verses 14 through 25, 14 through 29, which is the history of pagan Rome. Verse 14. Now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Now remember, in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, and chapter 8, Daniel has been given us the history of the rise and fall of world powers. The Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. And verse 14 says, also violent men of your people, literally means robberies of the people, shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. Rome began growing as a small nation. And one of the things they did was rather unique is instead of just going to war, they became um, protectors. And if you needed protection, they would give it to you. Of course, you had to pay high taxes and you had to give all your men up to go to war. And so what Daniel is describing is Rome flexing her muscles. Notice in verse 15, And so the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound and take a fortified city. And the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. So Daniel is now describing the, the demise of the Greek empire and the rise of the Roman Empire. Verse 16, But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. Remember, Daniel was writing in context of, of how history impacts the nation of Israel. And in, in, in 63 B.C., the general, Roman general Pompey entered Palestine after three months of fighting and he would destroy them. And for two centuries, Rome would have an impact on the nation of Israel. Let's drop down to verse 21. And in, and in his place shall arise a vile person to whom 
They will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peacefully and seize the kingdom by intrigue. With the forces of the flood, they shall be swept away before him and be broken. Also the prince of the covenant, Daniel 11, 22. So, what are they talking about here? Caesar. Pardon? Caesar. Caesar. Specifically, Tiberius Caesar. Remember you notice when he said he was, he was vile? Well, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, was nearing the end of his life. And he was needing somebody to follow in his footsteps. But he didn't have a son. And so he was looking for someone. And his wife kept saying, why don't you choose Tiberius? And he said, Tiberius is just too mean-spirited. It would ruin my legacy. The person that he had an idea of choosing up and died on him. Isn't that a terrible thing to do? Just up and die on the guy? And so Augustus' wife does something. It's called nagging. And she nagged him and nagged him and nagged him until he finally said, Okay, Tiberius will follow me. Luke tells us that the time of Christ and Tiberius was the Caesar of Rome, one who called for taxation. He's the one that would be Caesar when Jesus was crucified. Remember in Daniel 9, 27, that he shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring it to an end and to sacrifice and offerings. This is only the Tiberius. And nobody liked him. And I guess he didn't really care. He was so mean, so as Daniel says, he was so vile. In fact, when he was on his deathbed, his assistants, his servants, thought that he had died. But then he revived again. And they murdered him. They suffocated him to death. The whole city of Rome <clears throat> celebrated the death of this Caesar because he was so mean. And it says he came in peacefully because his mother he didn't have to go to war to become the next Caesar. His mother kept nagging Augustus until he said, yeah, you can be the next Caesar. And as Rome grew, many Caesars would send out armies to conquer countries. This is what the text we read this morning. One of the wars that Rome decided to have was with Egypt. And verse 28 says, And while returning to his land with great riches. That's all about Augustus. He went to war against Egypt. And Egypt lost. And then it says, verse 28, His heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his own land. So while Tiberius was, when he became Caesar, he sent, in A.D. 70, he sent Titus to put down a revolt in Jerusalem and to burn the city to the ground. And the Roman soldiers entered the city and they pitched their standards and their pagan gods as signs of victory. Today we would using football as the different standards of the different teams. And because Rome had many gods, they would bring all these symbols in showing that their gods were more powerful than the gods of Israel. And that's why Daniel refers to this sign of abomination and desolation. In Matthew 23, Jesus reminds the children of Israel it says, just before he was crucified, he told the Jewish leaders, see, your house is left unto you desolate. 
And as Jesus hung on the cross, what happened in the temple? What happened to that curtain? It was ripped. It was ripped from top to bottom. So it was not a man-made event. Jesus says, your house is empty. And Jesus was crucified in the morning. During the morning sacrifices. And he died in the time of the evening sacrifices. And the sanctuary service would be replaced by abomination and desolation. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Daniel 11, 31. His forces shall rise up, profane the fortified sanctuary, stopping the daily sacrifices in its place, they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Now, the angel talking to Daniel is talking about the collapse of pagan Rome and the rise of papal Rome. And we bring to an end the sacrifices. Verse 29, at the appointed time he shall return and go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. This is the time of Constantine. You remember, Constantine was, a, was a, an amazing uh, politician, and he recognized that his kingdom was collapsing, and so he divided his kingdom into east and west. And he moved to the west, to the east. <clears throat> The empire was collapsing. Really, the only stability that, that the empire had was the influence of the church, which was in the west part of the empire. And so he gave papal Rome authority of the western part of the empire. And Constantine moved to the east. And so from verses 30 to 45, the angel introduces us to papal Rome. It says, verse 34, ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Daniel is now talking about the invasion of the barbarians. And this particular verse is specifically talking about the vandals. It's, it's amazing. They came in and they destroyed almost the entire Roman navy. And from them we get that word vandalism, from the nation of the vandals. Verse 30 says, and the, the return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. He's describing these Germanic tribes coming in and destroying the Roman Empire. If I remember Daniel 2, he said, the legs of iron, but the feet hard iron, hard clay, these barbaric tribes would take over what was then known as the Roman Empire and break it into ten different pieces. Remember I told you, Constantine set up the, the, the Bishop of Rome, which we would call the Pope, the Bishop of Rome as the Caesar of Western Rome. And so the the Bishop of Rome could take the scepter in his hands and took the seat of Caesar, becoming not only the spiritual head of the, of the Western Empire, but also the political head of the Western Empire. Because the church had no power of its own, it depended upon Roman armies to do its bidding. And just as the little horn rose out of the fourth beast, described in Daniel 7, so in Daniel 11, verse 30, the Roman Empire begins its transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Verse 31, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifice and place there the abomination of desolation. Papal Rome would 
attack the ministry of Jesus in the most holy place, the sanctuary, or the holy place, the sanctuary. They would take away the daily sacrifices. Now, how they did this was they established their own sanctuary, their own worship, and their own priests. And unlike the priests of the sanctuary, they recognized that only God can forgive sins. The papal church set up a worship, set up a, a new priesthood where the priest could supersede God, supersede Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and forgive sins. Yeah. <coughs> and verses 31 through 35 tells us the papal Rome power was in control until it finally vanished the last opposition, the Orthodox in 538 AD. And the papacy showed its crushing power. Remember in verse 24, we read it earlier, it says, Therefore you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. This is, the, this is Satan working through papal Rome to do away with the sanctuary, to do away with Jesus' ministry on our behalf. Jesus is our minister. He's our mediator Amen. in heaven. And since 1844, he's been our mediator in the most holy place. But papal Rome wanted to destroy this, to create a counterfeit worship, a counterfeit priesthood. And after the 2300 prophecy, which ended in 1844, Jesus is not only our king, but he's our priest. Yeah. And through his ministry, we are promised victory over sin. Hallelujah. There's something else that the papal church did. It's found in Isaiah 66, verse 23. Isaiah 66 and verse 23. There are several things that the church did. You've heard this verse many times. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So what did the, pap what did the papal church do away with? The Sabbath. They enforced by legislation and by military might the worship of Sunday service. They did away with the Sabbath we brought in Sunday. But Isaiah says, you guys got it wrong. Because when we go to heaven, we're not going to go to church on Sunday. We're going to worship God on this seven-day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Another thing they did away with, one of the things they established, and Daniel 11 tells us, 11 and 37 years, that priests and nuns could not marry. They did away with the sacredness of marriage within the context of their worship. Let's go to verse 32 of Daniel 11. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do their God, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plundering. And now when they, they fall, they shall be aided 
with little help, but many shall join with them in intrigue. What does that mean? Well, it's talking about the Reformation. It's talking about men like Huss, Wycliffe. When they burned Huss to the cross, to the, when they burned Huss to the stake, Huss said, you may kill me, but God's going to raise up another man. He was talking about Luther. Amen. And a hundred years later, God rose up Luther. Now, Luther did not want to be a Hussite. He did. Who wants to get burned at the stake? This is what he's talking about. Men and women who were slain by the sword and burned at the stake. And during the Dark Ages, during that 1260-year time when the papal church had total control, superstition and tradition ruled the day. It's amazing how superstition creeps its way into the churches now. And elementary schools, high schools, colleges were not available to the everyday person. So the majority of the masses could not read or write. They were dependent on the priest to tell them what to believe. I'm so glad we don't live in that era. Amen. But God had people like the Waldensians and the Hussites and the Lollards. And they sacrificed their lives. They fell by the sword. This is, and in verse 35, it says, Some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. People were persecuted for 1260 years. Anybody who disagreed with them. In verse 35, Daniel references to the time of the end. He references that, he uses that terminology five different times in his book. <coughs> Daniel 7:25. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a times, times, half a times, or 1260 years. Until 1798, when Napoleon's general, Berthier, marches to Rome 